Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Give the Lord a praise. Yes, Lord. We trust you, God. Jesus, fear does not stand a chance. But we stand in your love, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How many are glad to be in the house of God today? Yes. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. It is so good to see everybody here today. If, uh, if you're new to our church, welcome. My name is Greg Johnson. I have the privilege of serving here as lead pastor. If you're uh, joining us, Mission Church Online, God bless you. It is good to have you with us as well. Amen. So excited about, uh, about the year ahead. How many are excited about 2021 being here? Beginning with 21 days of hunger. A season where we pray and we fast and we seek God for the outpouring of His blessings in this, in this year to come. And I hope that you'll join us on Wednesday nights at the Encounter Services for corporate prayer when we come together and, uh, and seek the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. And I'm excited about our new youth pastor. And uh, you, as, uh, as Pete mentioned, um, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> but it is important for you to know that when I became aware that Dylan, uh, uh, sorry, Pastor Dylan, was uh, uh, being considered for this role that I removed myself completely from the process um, because I didn't want to influence it and I didn't want my, my bias uh, to present. So um, Pastor Keith did an incredible job just supervising the whole process and not only looking at uh, Dylan as a candidate, but other candidates looking at other resumes, other interviews. And so Pastor Keith did a great job. Our board of trustees did a great job. Whenever the topic came up for discussion, I recused myself and, and uh, left the room, was not involved in any of the conversations um, at all. So, uh, so I'm so excited that, uh, that Dylan is going to be our youth pastor. Dylan is going to be our, is our youth pastor because I know that the anointing of God is on his life. And that's what we want. It's not about his last name. It's not about what family he comes from. It's about the anointing of the Holy Spirit on his life. And that's what we need to be praying for him about. Amen. So who will be praying this year for Pastor Dylan and the youth ministry? What an awesome youth ministry we have. Amen. All right. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we're going to be in chapter 1. Today we're continuing the series on the life of of Christ, where we look at different events through the life of Christ and uh, what they mean to us and what we can learn about our walk with God as we look at Jesus and his example in the Gospels. Today, we're talking about the temptation of Christ, or accurately, the temptations of Christ. We're going to be in Mark chapter 1, and then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4. So Mark 1 verse 9, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then verse 12, Immediately, everybody say immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And was with the wild beasts, and the, or with wild, that's like, a, that sounds like a youth pastor. He was with the wild beasts, and the, <laughs> and the angels ministered to him. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go over to Matthew chapter 4, so you can turn there. But before we, we get into the actual temptations that, that Jesus faced, there's a few introductory truths that need to be established. First, the devil is not a myth. The devil is not a legend. The devil is not a metaphor. The devil is a real being who is active and who is alive in this world. And if you doubt that, just turn on the news headlines and see what's going on all around the world today. Secondly, if the devil is real, which he is, then temptation is also real. 
And this is what we read here in Mark chapter 1 and what we also see in Matthew chapter 4, and we see it also in the Gospel of Luke. The enemy wants to pull you out of God's will by enticing you and ensnaring you and captivating you. James chapter 1. Verse 14 says, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. This is the end of temptation. To suffocate us in sin and to destroy our relationship with God. Third, just because you are being led by the Spirit and you are doing the will of God, does not mean you won't face the enemy or temptation. Jesus had just been baptized. The heavens opened. The Father spoke. The Spirit came upon Him. And then what happened? Did He rush into ministry? Did He start preaching and healing and working miracles? No. Mark 1.12 says, The Spirit drove Him into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by Satan. In in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Before Jesus could be effective, he had to learn how to fight. Not as God. We know that Jesus was fully God. Amen? But when Jesus came to earth, he walked the earth as a man. And he had to learn how to fight and overcome as a man Trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It's what we call the necessity of an enemy. It's David facing Goliath. It's Daniel in the lion's den. It's Joshua before the walls of Jericho. It's Job and all of his misery. It's it's Moses and, and the Red Sea. God allows the enemy to rise against us. That in doing so, it would expose our, our vulnerabilities so that God can work on those vulnerabilities and we can be strengthened and we can be sanctified and empowered to overcome. Fourth, every great leader, every powerful Christian with a testimony will have spent some time in the wilderness. How many know about the wilderness? Anybody here? Chuck Swindoll when referring to uh, the example of Jacob wrestling with the angel, he said, never trust a leader who doesn't have a limp. In other words, don't trust some leader who has never gone through something where God has had to do a deep work in him that has transformed his life and his character, and it's evident in the way that he walks and interacts and deals with people. John Maxwell said, Everything worthwhile in life is uphill. Everything. Does anybody here know about uphill? Anybody here at all? Amen, right? In Matthew chapter 20, the mother of James and John came to Jesus and said, Jesus, grant that my sons may sit on your right hand and your left hand when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus immediately said to her, he said, woman, you don't know what you're asking. He said, This requires that they first drink my cup and then that they are baptized with my baptism. In other words, Jesus was saying there's always a process involved in promotion. A process that involves a cup of suffering and a baptism into death where you are resurrected into a newness of life and reformed character. Jesus was saying to that mother, he was saying, be careful what you ask for for your kids. How many moms? Amen? Because no one gets promoted, Jesus said, without first drinking the cup. With every victory, there will be some agony. If you want an anointing, there must first be a crushing. If you want success, you're going to see some failure. If you want a higher level, you're going to have to face a higher devil. Between you and the seat that God called you to, there will always be a cup. So let me ask you, how many still want to go to the next level in God? Not too many. I didn't think so. Okay. So Matthew chapter 4, let's look at that. And we're going to take a look at these temptations now that we've established these principles. And uh, 
The first temptation we see is in verses 1 through 4. We're in Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. I guess so. Now when the tempter came to him and said, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So what do we learn from this about temptation? Well, first we have to remember the definition of temptation. It's it's to entice you out of the Father's will, to suffocate you in sin, and to destroy your relationship with God. So the question is, how does this event here entice Jesus into sin? It's just making bread. There's nothing evil about bread, amen? Unless you're doing 21 days of hunger, then bread is very evil. But it's not like Jesus is robbing a bank, right? Well, we need to understand Jesus' purpose. John 6, 38, Jesus said this, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The point of this temptation was to get Jesus to act independent of God's leading and God's authority in his life. To get Jesus to step out of God's will and do his own will for his own interests. Amen? That's what he was trying to get Jesus to do here. To act independent of the Father in order to meet his own needs. So how does the devil do this? Not only with Jesus, but in our lives. A couple of things. First, notice that the devil enticed Jesus at the point of his need. He attacked Jesus where he was hungry. Where he wanted something. Where he was weak. So here's Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days fasting. He's hungry. He's got an appetite. He wants to eat. And along comes the devil and says, Hey, Jesus, you hungry? You can fix that, you know. You're the Son of God. Just go ahead and make some bread out of these stones. I mean, it's nothing for you if you're the creator of the heavens and the earth. See, the enemy knows that we are vulnerable as human beings, as men and women. We are vulnerable when we are needy, when we are hungry, when we want something. See, that's what the devil did to Job. Remember the story in Job? When when the devil went to God and said, God, the only reason that Job serves you is because you have blessed him and you have met all of his needs. And the devil said, let me strike him down and let me strip him of all of the blessings and all of the provision and all of the resources. Let me bring him to that point of neediness and want and he will curse you to your face. This is the devil's first point of attack. In fact, this was his first point of attack on Jesus. He enticed Jesus where he was hungry, where he was needy. Then, next, once the devil has leveraged your hunger, your neediness, he then offers a solution to pull Jesus outside of God's will. Turn these stones into bread. See, Jesus' mission was not to reveal himself as Almighty God. Although we know Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. Jesus was not there to exalt himself as God. He was walking the earth to identify with mankind so that he could live as a man and so that he could identify with the sins of mankind and take mankind's sins to the cross. That was his purpose. In fact, that's why Jesus always referred to himself as the Son of Man. He was always taking the attention off of the fact that he was God and wanted the world to know that he was identifying as a man. So the devil thought that because Jesus was hungry, he could get Jesus to act in his own interest, to step out of God's will, trusting in God to meet his needs... Amen. 
and to act on his own to meet his own needs. And the devil presented a solution. Turn these stones into bread. See, the devil thinks that if you're needy enough, that if you're hungry enough, you're vulnerable. And the devil thinks that he can come to you in your place of need and he can get you to turn some stones into bread. In other words, to meet your own need using things that God never designed you should use to meet that need. And depending on what your need is, he offers a solution accordingly. He brings you some stones. He says to the single young lady, I know you feel lonely. I know you feel like time is slipping by, but I got a solution. Here's a cute guy on Facebook. He's not saved? That's okay. Maybe you could turn him into your bread. Maybe he can satisfy that need. Go ahead, the devil says. Send him a message. Go ahead, the devil says. Just one date. Go ahead, the devil says. It's just one night at his apartment. The devil tries to get us to take stones and turn them into something that God never intended. The devil says to the man, I know your wife doesn't respect you. So go ahead and have lunch with that lady from accounting. That woman from accounting is not for that man. He's got a wife. But the devil presents a solution and tells us to turn that thing into something that God never intended. The devil says, I know you're struggling financially, so you don't need to tithe. you got all those things on Amazon that you want to buy. Take God's tithe and use it to buy all your toys on Amazon. The devil says, I know you feel lonely. Have a drink. I know you feel stressed. Have a smoke. I know you need time to relax and rest. So go ahead. You don't need to go to church. Just stay home. Watch it online and just relax. See, the issue for Jesus was not so much making bread. It was an issue of stepping outside of God's will and satisfying His own needs in ways that God never intended He should do so. And it's when you're needy, and you're hurting, and you're lacking, disappointed, wounded, that's when the enemy comes right alongside And starts whispering in your ears and presents solutions that God never intended. And so how did Jesus overcome? Look at what Jesus said in verse 4. The devil says, here's some stones, turn them into bread. And Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. What's interesting in his response is the first word that Jesus used to set himself up for victory. He said, man. In other words, Jesus, we know he was God, but in replying to the devil, he asserted his identity as a man that was surrendered to the will and the word of God. That's how he overcame He affirmed, I'm not here to be God. I'm not here to be autonomous. I'm not here to do my own thing. I'm here as a man. And as a man, I am dependent and I trust on the Word of God and the plan of God and the will of God that God will satisfy my need in His time. I'm a man submitted to the sovereignty of God. And that's how we overcome. And this is the resolve that each of us needs to have in our hearts as we're walking through this world. In fact, this is one reason why it's so important for us to gather together in God's house and worship. Do you know worship is a weapon of warfare? Because in worship, we are recentering our spirit and we are refocusing ourselves on our purpose and reaffirming that we exist not to meet our own needs, but we exist for the purposes and the will of God. That's what we do. In wor- worship's not about God touching me and blessing me and ministering to me. Worship's about me blessing God and touching God and ministering to God and lifting up my hands to God and offering myself to God in a sacrifice of praise. And saying, Lord God, I am here to serve you. Help me to trust in you. Help me to trust in your timing. I don't need to understand why. I don't need to understand when. I only need to reaffirm that you are my God. And I trust in you. And you will bring me through. 
And in that context of worship, do you know what we're doing? We're resisting the devil. And the Bible says in James 4, 7 that if we resist the devil, what happens? He must flee. He cannot stand being around people who worship and affirm their obedience to God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus said, man, and I am a man, I shall not live by bread, by satisfying myself with your pittance. I will, I will live by the word and the plan of God for my life. Amen? Amen. Second temptation we see in verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Then Jesus said to him, It is written again. Everybody say again. (laughs) You shall not tempt the Lord your God. A few truths here. First, notice the location, the place where this temptation occurs. In the holy city, Jerusalem, on the pinnacle of the temple. It's the only time in the Bible when the devil took Jesus to church. And then when he got him to church, the temple, he tried to kill him. Don't think, here's the lesson, don't think that because you're in church, or you're in a ministry, or you have some position in the church, that you won't find the devil there. Don't think that because you're in church that you won't find temptation there. Some of your hardest battles will be fought in godly Christian circles. And I don't know why people get so surprised when they go to church and they find there's conflict there. What did you think? We're all perfect? Do you think this was a perfect church? Well, actually, it was a perfect church until you got here because you're imperfect. It's not perfect anymore. (laughs) In church, listen, you will be disappointed. You will get offended. You will get hurt. There will be people there who won't like you. That's right, I'm talking to you. Okay, don't point to the person next to you. He's talking to you right now. I'm not talking, I'm talking to you. There will be people in church who don't like you. And that's the reason why we are called to love one another. To bear with one another. To forgive one another. God puts us in a place with all of these imperfect people, unholy people, not yet sanctified people, and He he tells us that we've got to interact together, we've got to talk to each other, we've got to work with each other, we've got to build relationships, we've got to do life together. And in the context of that, yes, you're going to get offended. You're going to get hurt. You may even feel betrayed. But guess what? i got good news. For those of you who want to be more like Jesus, anybody here want to be more like Jesus? You'll never be like Jesus until you have a Judas in your life. Amen? Right? I know church hurt is a real thing. I see all the complainers out there on the internet. I know church hurt is a real thing. I get it, right? But don't be a church runaway. Don't be a runaway. Amen? Right? It's, it's part of your sanctification. Just think of yourself as a block of wood with some rough edges, and all the people around you are sandpaper. Okay? Now you can tell that person he's talking to you now. Right? And, and sometimes some people just are a little abrasive, and they're a little rough, and when you get around them, you know, they, they just scrape up against you. Right? But God has them in your life for a reason. Because He loves you, too much to leave you as you are. And he's got to change you. And that's why we have the church. Amen? Amen. All right, let me move on. Second, the devil tried to provoke his pride and his position as the Son of God. He said, if you're the Son of God, Throw yourself down. If you're really God, then go ahead and step out and show us your power and show us your glory and show us how special you are. Take the spotlight and reveal how great you really are. Here's a lesson from this. Remember, if the devil can't stop you, he'll get behind you and push. 
That's what he was doing here. He was trying to push Jesus into the spotlight when it wasn't God's timing for that to happen. Because with advancement and promotion and enlargement in the kingdom of God comes greater pressure, greater temptations, more intense warfare, right? Martin Lloyd-Jones said that it's the worst thing that can happen to a man is for him to be promoted before he is ready. God has a process to prepare us for the pressures and the temptations that come with promotion. A process. Everybody say process. But the devil wants us to step over or circumnavigate that process and he wants to elevate us before our character is deep enough, before our integrity is deep enough, before our humility is deep enough to support or withstand the pressures and the temptations that come with promotion. And leaders get into trouble when their integrity does not keep pace with the momentum created by their giftedness. And so the devil will try to push you into opportunity. He'll try to open doors for your promotion because he knows that leadership will destroy the man or the woman whose character is not prepared for it. If he can't stop you because he knows you're hungry for Jesus and he knows you're a student of the Word and he knows there's an anointing on your life and he knows he can't stop you. So what does he do? He gets behind you and he starts pushing. He'll whisper to you about your potential. He'll tell you how special you are. He'll say it's time for you to take your place. And he'll try to open doors before you and get you in a place where you're vulnerable because your character, your integrity, your humility is not yet prepared for what comes. How many are hearing what I'm saying this morning? Amen? Respect the process. Just tell somebody that. Respect the process. Amen. Amen. Thirdly, the devil tried a judo tactic with Jesus. He tried to use the force, the momentum of Jesus' own faith against him. See, Jesus overcame that first temptation by basically saying, I don't need to turn stones into bread because I trust that God's plan is perfect and I have faith that God will provide for my need because His Word assures me of that. And then the devil turned, tried to turn that around on Jesus. And he said, well, if you trust God so much, if you got so much faith, then why don't you throw yourself off the temple and let's see if God catches you. And Jesus came back and said, no devil, that's tempting or that's testing God. He basically was saying, that's, it's presumptuous to think that God will accommodate our foolishness or disregard our own foolishness and save us. True faith, listen, true faith is not presumption. In other words, we cannot disregard biblically sound life principles and then presume that when we disregard God's word that God's still going to bless us and work it out on our behalf. I love to say the best is yet to come. How many love that statement? That's not just a cliche. I say the best is yet to come because I know that today I'm sowing good seeds, healthy seeds, obedient seeds to God's Word that will bring a bountiful harvest tomorrow. My expectation of what God is going to do in the future is based on the promises of His Word that are in place now that I respect and that I walk in. Amen? Right? God will never do by miracle what we should do through common sense and obedience to His Word. Did you get that? God will never supernaturally do something for us that we should be doing simply in common sense and through obedience to His Word. Right? One person says, well, I'm trusting God to meet my needs. And I say, well, do you have a job? No, but God provides, and if God wants me to have a job, something will open up. And I'll say, well, have you been applying? No, I'm just trusting God. You're not trusting God, you're being presumptuous. Because God's Word says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Amen? You've got to get out there. You've got to find a job. You've got to knock on doors. You've got to get your resume up, right? You've got to post your, your availability. Amen? 
Someone says, I really believe God wants to bless me with this, this new car. I really believe that. And I say, okay, well, uh, how much does it cost? Well, don't bother me with all that faith stuff. Well, what are the payments going to be? Right? I don't know. I just know that God has opened this door and this, God's in control and God will provide. Or, 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 or one sister says, I know God wants me to marry this man. I can tell you how many times I've heard that in my pastoral journey. And I say, mm-hmm. And I say, is he saved? Well, he goes to church. <laughs> okay. Uh, does he serve in the church? Does he, does he tithe in the church? Does he... Read the Bible? Does he even have a favorite scripture? Does he have any girlfriends? Oh, but he's just brought him into my life. And it's amazing how many times, because we're hungry, because we're needy, that we convince ourselves that something is from God. It's turning stones into bread. It's trying to make something out of nothing that God has provided. The devil will try to invert your faith and use it against you. Now look, how did Jesus overcome? Verse 7, Jesus said, I like, what, I like what he said. He said, it is written again. And then he quotes the scripture. But I like the fact that he says, written again. You shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. Look at that word, again. In the NIV, it says, it is also written. In other words, the devil was trying to deceive Jesus by presenting one scripture and building a, a doctrine around it, a life principle around it. And Jesus' answer was, you're not going to get me with just one scripture. He said, I know more than just one scripture. He said, we need to interpret scripture with scripture, right? Right? So yeah, that's what, but, it, but the Word of God also says, and again it says, and over here it says, and that's how we use Scripture. We need to be skilled in the Word of God if we're going to overcome the lies of the enemy. And that means more than just knowing one Scripture because we saw a meme on Instagram. We need to get into the Word and rightly divide the truth and memorize the Scriptures. Just like it becomes a second language. Anyone who's bilingual, you understand what I'm talking about. Someone can say some things in English, and every time you know they say something in English, it's like you have words in Spanish or French or whatever it is that translate those words. We need to be that well-versed in Scripture that no matter what somebody says to us, we've got four or five other Scriptures that just pop up in the back of our heads. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Do you ever talk with somebody? It's like every time you say something, it's like they got, a, they got another Scripture. They always got a Scripture. Anybody know? Aren't those people annoying? But that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be one of those annoying people, right? That says, well, it is written again. Amen. All right, one more temptation we need to close. In fact, let me ask the worship team to join me up here. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So, simple point here. In this exchange, we see the devil's purpose revealed. He didn't want to kill Jesus. He wanted to use Jesus. Just as the devil doesn't want to kill you because he knows then you just go to heaven. <laughs> he wants to use you. He wants to corrupt you and twist you and use you for his deviant purposes. To bring you to a place where your life and your actions and your attitudes and your choices take glory from God. Where your life is no longer about bringing glory to God, but instead your life is about bringing glory not to the devil, because the devil's more subtle than that, but bringing glory to any other thing but God. He'll give you popularity. He'll give you success. He'll give you a social media following. He'll make you an influencer. He'll give you ministry. Anything you want, as long as you use it in a way that distracts from God. And sadly, 
Many people today are more interested in using God to gain a platform for themselves than they are in being used by God for His glory. And this is what Jesus said. Away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. Let's stand together. I'm going to close on this point. I want to close by bringing us to a place where we rededicate ourselves to God in worship. Where we make this a pivot point in our lives. I don't know what you may have been struggling with. Maybe the enemy has been tempting you. Maybe he's been coming against you. But you're in the right place today. If you're watching online, you're in the right place. We're going to take a moment. We're going to lift our hands to the Lord. And we're going to rededicate our lives to Him and say, Lord, my life is not about me. It's not about about my desires and my needs. It's about you, God. And I worship you, and I honor you, and I glorify you. And I resist the temptations and the lies and the deceptions of the enemy. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Lift a hand to the Lord right now. Would you do that? Just lift a hand to the Lord and just begin to tell the Lord, Jesus, I worship you. Come on, just tell him that. Jesus, I worship you. Lord, I worship you. I exalt you. Come on, lift up that other hand now, both hands up, and use your voice, use your mouth, and say, Lord, I exalt you. I glorify you. You are my God. You are my King. Come on, lift up your voice and say, and I resist every device of the enemy, every weapon formed against me, and I submit my life to you, my God. Hallelujah. Church, let's worship the Lord for a few moments before we, before we dismiss.